So without any further delay, come into tonight's session on traits of an excellent product manager. Let me give an introduction to our very distinguished eminent speaker of tonight, Kapil Verma. Kapil is a chief product officer at Make My Trip and is responsible for spearheading the product portfolio of hotels and alternate accommodation line of business. With over 18 years of global experience in product management, product marketing and general management, Kapil has worked across various industries, including travel, e-commerce, food tech, technology, and financial services. Kapil has earned his MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management and B.Tech in Computer Science from IIT Delhi. A very warm welcome to you, Kapil. We are thrilled to have you here with us tonight. Handing the session over to you now. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction, Shama. And thank you, Shama and the Institute for having me here. Um, are you guys able to hear me okay? Are you guys able to see me okay? Yes, Kapil. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, great. So let me just share my screen. So audience, while uh, Kapil gets ready with his talk, we have a few questions for you. And uh, please uh, keep your answers in the poll. So the first question being, how many of you are product managers? We'd like to know. Great. So uh, sharing the results, Kapil, are you able to see the results? Yes, I can see it. Okay, so it's a good mix. I think awesome. uh, a good mix of people who are aspiring to be product managers. Okay. Right. We do have another question for your audience. So, we want to know uh, which industry do you come from? Are you currently working with? Great. So it's dominated by the IT crowd. Sharing the results now with you, Kapil. Thank you, folks. So, Kapil, you can start with your presentation. Cool. Shama, you'll have to stop sharing the screen. Oh, yes. Sorry. Great. Okay. Very interesting, very diverse audience over here, at least in terms of how many are doing product management and how many are aspiring to. Uh, can you guys see my screen? We can, Kapil. Okay, great. All right. So uh, let's start. And since many of you actually are aspiring to be product managers, I'll also talk a little bit about the basics of product management and hopefully this will be useful. But we'll focus the today's session more on talking about what differentiates an exceptional product manager from a good product manager, right? Um, so I just want to start off on a personal note and um, give a little bit like, you know, personal introduction to all of you guys. So who am I as a person? and you know, these four pictures, you know, you can say they represent the four loves of my life. So on the left is my family and, you know, my wife and two kids during happier times, you know, when we could all travel. I think this was uh, two years ago in Goa. In the center, you see the Indian cricket team. So I'm a huge cricket fan and I played cricket uh, during college and also corporate cricket. And the highlight of me as a cricket fan was, you know, watching the India team play Australia in Melbourne in 2018. Um, a series, you know, which, which they won the Boxing Day Test match. Um, on the right is, you know, you, you see Filter Coffee. So, you know, big foodie and like to explore different cuisines. And, you know, we are currently based in Bangalore and really like the South Indian cuisine and, you know, uh, Filter Coffee. And that's something, you know, we've been exploring around Bangalore. And then lastly, Travel Puff, uh, you know, like many of you, I'm sure, as well. And no wonder I'm working for a Travel Puff these days. Okay. Um, Professionally, I think Shama touched upon some of this. So, you know, started off my career after IIT, worked as a software engineer for some time. I went to the US, uh, worked at Capital One, um, you know, in product and marketing roles. Then post MBA, McKinsey for a few years. And then 2009 is, you know, when we moved back to India and uh, started off with Adobe, leading product management and product marketing for a portfolio of uh, technical communication line of products. Um, then uh, moved to Amazon and at Amazon, I actually uh, worked on launching and scaling up the B2B business for Amazon India. So building the product from scratch and some learning, some good learnings from there. So that was three years. Uh, then uh, always wanted to work for a smaller company, a growth stage company. So uh, moved to Swiggy in the last couple of years, like you know, basically I've been doing uh, product management on the restaurant side, uh, apps, kitchen tech and post order customer experience. And one year ago is, you know, when I moved to Go, Go MMT and uh, working as a chief product officer, they're handling the accommodation product. Okay. And of course, the last year has been a crazy year, I'm sure for all of you, uh, but especially uh, in the travel sector, it has been a very, very challenging year, but one full of learning. Okay. So, 
so let's uh, talk about uh, two things as i mentioned i'll cover the product management basics and <clears throat> i think a good half half uh, of you are actually aspiring so i think you might find this section useful but like i said we'll focus more on the second part um, which is the traits of an exceptional pm <clears throat> so what does a product manager do right um and you know here is a here is a funny take on it uh, depending on who you ask which is actually true so you know your mom might think that you know you are the next steve jobs working on the next cool gadget and mailing it to the world your your colleagues might think that you know you are a you you're a nerd <laughs> in deep into numbers um whereas in reality you might be like you know chicken with its head cut off trying to save the world and like you know just just ship the ship the product out right um but you know on a serious note there is no one definition of product management right because the product manager role varies uh, from company to company from industry to industry and it also varies depending on like you know what you want it to be right um so there is no one definition there are some core principles which i'll talk about but the role you know having worked at like you know different companies mncs indian companies small and large companies there are variations in the role but if you if you really look at it the heart of it i think a, a pm lives at the intersection of user experience technology and business right um and a pm actually needs to be conversant with all of those three but they don't need to be a specialist right because as a pm you would actually work with people from all of these three domains uh so you need to understand the business side of things so you can understand the impact of product that you're launching what kind of business impact they're creating of course you need to understand technology and in terms of like you know what is feasible how do you use technology to provide a better customer experience and then you know you should also be passionate about user experience of course right in terms of <clears throat> how the customers are using the product and how do you improve the user experience right so uh, you know being a nerd myself i actually had to have a venn diagram in my presentation so here it is right um but let me talk about you know as per me i think there are three questions which a pm should focus on right so what are these three questions the first question is who is our customer so who is the customer you are building the product for you know for example in the b2b space is it an enterprise is it a small and medium company in the b2c space is it you know youth is it like a senior citizen is it somebody in the metro is it somebody in the rural area so having and we'll talk a lot about this right but having clarity on who's your customer and who you're building it for is very very important <clears throat> the second problem a question is what so what problems are we solving for them right um so customers actually have different you know pain points and as a pm you'll have to prioritize specific problems that you want to work on and again we'll talk about this a lot in the coming slides and then the last question is to solve these problems what products do i need to build what feature should i build and why should we build it right so the who is our customer what problems are we solving and what products we are building right that's those are the three basic questions which a product manager must answer right and i want to make this interactive right uh, i want all of you guys to participate now and what you can do is you know you can just type in your responses in the chat window Uh, because you know we have like a lot of lot of you over here so it would not be possible to hear you guys but uh let's just work through this case right so let's say you know 4 or 5 years back you know there was no swiggy there was no zomato and you had this idea of launching a food delivery service right so so let's talk about who would be your customer who is the customer that you are targeting with this one audience let's make this session interactive and so post your uh, answers in the uh, chat section or in the q and a section so we can read it out yeah and i'm looking at the chat great okay so bachelors living away from home okay very good office goers sure working bachelors i see a trend over here people think that bachelors are the ones who order food typically not the only segment okay <laughs> tired after work very nice travelers human food consumers okay metropolitan working couples working couples so i see another sort of pattern like working couples who are busy don't have time to cook 
people who eat food out from outside of home okay that's interesting so anybody who eats outside food is a, is a target customer yeah so good i think you guys get the idea right so you know basically it's anybody you know who wants to order in like you know they value that convenience that i don't want to cook right or i'm not in the mood to cook so anybody who wants to order in and get food delivered is basically a customer and of course there are different segments and then you know, some segments were early adopters right now what problems are you solving so again type in your responses in the chat window so just imagine if you were launching a food delivery service what problems were there in the current experience for these customers which you would want to solve through the solution that you are building easy access via phone okay commuting yeah i mean i think what i mean by is people don't want to kind of travel and go to a restaurant quick service delivery at footsteps okay single platform multiple options so basically have a choice of lot of restaurants good convenience yeah options we have a few answers in the q and a window as well kapil okay sure but i think again you know you guys are actually covering like a lot of the you know problems that you know you would want to solve with the service and i'll just flash like you know some of them right <clears throat> so i mean if you if you think about it before this you would probably have to call a restaurant and then like an order food but the reliability of delivery was not there right you would not know when the food would arrive there was no one stop shop you know you guys talked about this which is uh, you know you actually had to call up multiple restaurants you know with swiggy or zomato you can easily compare multiple multiple restaurants there was no real time tracking of food right so the, the guy actually had left the restaurant you had no idea i mean you had to call the restaurant the restaurant would call that Uh, delivery boy and then like you know, it was a it was very very difficult to track uh, food delivery right and cash payment right i mean typically you would need to have cash to pay for that delivery right um and so you know what to build and these are some of the um, pain points but there could be a lot of others as well but what to build would be we don't want to build an app for consumers to easily find and discover restaurants so they can you know find lots of restaurants they can compare you know dishes prices etc place order and real time track their orders right and in you know, a delivery of course you know would be very reliable like if you say 40 minutes you will get the food in 40 minutes right so that's an example of you know going through this framework and then saying that okay i have this idea but who is the customer i'm building it for what problems am i solving and like you know what am i building to solve those problems okay so enough i think gyan there's this work on a real customer problem and again i would go back to my swiggy days this was a problem that like you know we were working on and again i want your participation so unfortunately i'm sure many of you would be familiar with the scenario right there's a customer you place an order you know you are waiting for the food you know you have figured out the movie on amazon prime or netflix that you want to watch your friends are here and suddenly you get this notification unfortunately that hey you know we had to cancel your order right so it's not the customer who's canceling the order but you know swiggy or restaurant is canceling the order right it's a bad customer experience right so so there's this talk about you know how would you if you were the pm who were responsible for this how would you solve this problem right so let's just talk about the reasons why an order would get cancelled and again please type in the chat window the reasons you can think of due to which an order would get cancelled okay bad weather yeah Auto stock, yeah. Supply of riders does not match. Yep, that's a good one. Appliance issues interesting. So appliance at the restaurant is not working. Okay. A lot of like you know answers on delivery issues. Maybe the delivery person is not available, etc. Ah, that's interesting. Uh, the owners forgot to shut the restaurant. So I mean, it, it should open on the app, but the restaurant was actually closed. right yeah issues with the app yeah that could be the order was not related to the restaurant for example technical issue so again good good set of answers so you know how you would actually solve the problem is you would actually break it up into like you know logical components right so this is structured problem solving so the order got cancelled what could be the reasons 
either the restaurant canceled the order or it could be the food delivery company canceled the order, right? So this is, you know, what we call DC, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. So these two reasons actually cover all the possible, you know, universe choices. And then like, you know, they are mutually exclusive as well, as well right? Now within the restaurant canceled the order, you guys touched upon some of this, maybe the restaurant ran out of stock, the restaurant was closed. Again, somebody mentioned that. On the second one, food delivery company canceled the order. Again, you guys mentioned maybe there are not enough riders to fulfill the order. There's actually an order relay failure, which again, somebody mentioned, right? So you would go down this tree and then like, you know, you'll keep on like, you know, going to the next level and going to the next level of problem solving. So let's talk about the first one, right? This is out of stock. So restaurants got more demand than they anticipated. We don't know how to mark an item as out of stock in the restaurant app. There was a special day, like, you know, there was a game going on and hence there was a lot of demand similar to the first point. It could be a reliability issue, right? So, you know, raw materials that the restaurants actually procure, uh, you know, that supply is not reliable and leading to auto stock. And there could be like you know, some technical issues in terms of auto stock reflecting on that, right? So these are like, you know, again, some of the reasons. And then once you actually reach this level, then as a PM, you will start to think about the solution. Okay. So the first one, restaurant got more demand than they anticipated. How do I solve this problem? Maybe what I can do is, you know, I can provide a forecast to the restaurant that, hey, on Saturday for lunch, you will typically get so many orders of biryani, right? And that would actually help them like, you know, stock up the, uh, the, the raw materials accordingly, right? On the second one, if it's a usability issue, right? You would actually work on the feature so that restaurant owners know how to mark an item as out of stock and they are aware of this feature, right? And so on and so forth. So I would not actually go through each of each of these, but the point that I'm trying to make is, you know, this would be typical sort of problem solving and solutioning you would do as a product manager, right? And this is a good example of how you would take a problem and break it up into logical components. And then at the root level of the tree is like, you know, where you would think of the solutions, right? So again, so these are the basics for you to be an effective product manager, right? Customer focus, understanding your customers, problem solving, we talked about it, you know, structured thinking, of course, you would use a lot of data, right? Uh, you would need analytical and statistical skills as well. Uh, understanding of technology. And then as a PM, you know, uh, you would actually work with multiple stakeholders. The collaboration and communication is very, very important. But this is not what we'll be talking about today. So as I mentioned, I mean, these are the things that you would need to be effective as a PM. What we're going to talk about today is what differentiates an excellent PM, an exceptional PM from a good one, right? And as I think about it, there are actually six traits, you know, six behaviors, six traits, six habits that differentiate an exceptional PM from a good PM, right? So what are those? Let's talk about those. So the first one, I think an exceptional PM you know, they understand their customers deeply, right? They understand their customers so well that they can think of solutions, even if the customers are not articulating those, right? Even if the customers are not articulating certain pain points, um, because the PM understands their customers so well, they can think of those pain points which are unarticulated and then think of solutions for those pain points. That's number one. Second is, an exceptional PM actually has clarity on where they are going. Um, so they actually have clarity on the long term, not just the here and now execution. And I'll talk about uh, that a lot more. The third one, which I like to call, they are right a lot. So, you know, this is not magic. This is not any magical superpower where they can forecast the future, but a systematic process that they would follow to make the right decisions make the right investment decisions in terms of like, you know, which areas to invest in on the products. The fourth one is they say no a lot, right? So, and we'll talk about this. Prioritization is very, very important uh, in a PM job. So as a product manager, are you saying no to enough things so that you're focusing on a few things? That is something an exceptional PM, I think like, you know, they do it and they do it quite well. The fifth one is they think 10x, not just 10%. So what I mean is they think big, they think about like, you know, new possibilities, they think of 
totally new solutions versus just incremental improvements. Okay. And the last one is, you know, you know, product manager, as we were discussing, is at the center of it all, right? And they're working with so many different teams, right? And all of these teams, you know, engineering, design, business, you know, they form an orchestra, right? And taking that analogy. And, you know, PM is basically a very good conductor of this orchestra, right? So they're like, they're like this conductor who actually like, you know, takes the entire orchestra and like, and creates a very nice symphony, right? So those are the six traits, which I think, you know, basis, I've actually worked with PMs in different industries, a lot of different PMs at different levels. But I think those are the six traits which make for an exceptional product manager. So let's talk about each one of those, right? And again, I would want your participation as we go along. Uh, there are a few questions that I do want to pose to you guys. So let's talk about the first one, right? Understanding their customers deeply. Right. And, you know, here is a quote that, you know, you can read uh, from Steve Jobs. Um, but basically an exceptional PM, as I mentioned, they understand their customers so well that like, you know, they can think of how to improve the customer experience, how to solve for the pain points, even before the customers can actually think of those things, right? So even before the customers realize it themselves, they actually needed this product and they need the solution. The PM is able to think, think about it. You know, there's a fam famous Henry Ford quote where he said that if I actually wanted, uh, you know, if I actually had asked people what they wanted, rather, uh, everybody would have said faster horses. You know, nobody would have actually said that they needed a car, right? Because it's not the customer's job to think of solutions. It's the product manager's job. You have to read between the lines. You have to understand your customers so well so that, you know, you can actually like, you know, think about how do you take the experience to the next level. So how do you actually do it? How do you actually understand your customers so well? Um, one of the ways in which you know you can do that is you know what I like to call a customer development process, right? So it has uh, four parts. So you start with customer discovery, right? Which is basically the the process that you follow to understand your customers very well. You do that through interviews, focus groups, etc. Then once you actually have a, a hypothesis, an idea that you want to test, you would actually like you know launch a, a product. Uh, maybe an MVP version, and we'll talk about that as well. You will do the validation, and then, like you know, basis the learning. You know, you'll go through that loop, and maybe in some cases you would completely pivot and like you know think of something else as well. So this part is actually very very important, right? Um, you know, doing customer discovery so that you understand who your customers are, what their requirements, and how do you actually like you know address those is very very important. And there is no substitute for going out and meeting customers, right? I mean, you would not find any insight sitting in your offices. Um, so this is talk about the customer discovery. Like, you know, what are the things that like, you know, you can do? And I'm sure uh, since many of you are already PMs, uh, you would be aware uh, aware and familiar with some of these, uh, these techniques, but you know, you would go and have one-on-one -on -one customer meetings. Um, you would form an advocate group, for example, where you actually have a panel of customers, you know, through, through which, you know, you get a frequent and like, you know, quick feedback. You know, one of the things that I have done, you know, here at Make My Trip and also at previous companies is we have this monthly consumer pulse program where we actually go out and meet customers. I mean, of course, these days it's over Zoom, but you would physically like, you know, meet customers and each month, like, you know, we pick a different topic that we want to understand a little better. So it could be like, we want to understand customers who book budget hotels, or it could be like customers who are booking an apartment, what are their unique needs? So how do we actually understand those? And like, you know, all the members of the product team and also design engineering, we would go and meet with customers and we get a lot of very interesting and useful insights. Second one I want to call out is listening to customer support calls, right? This is, this is very important. It's very, very powerful because when you actually listen to these calls, it really gives you a good insight in terms of, you know, what, what are the issues customers are facing? Why are they calling us? You know, where are they stuck, right? So it's very, very important uh, to do that on an ongoing basis. Things like prototyping and usability testing, consumer research, of course, are there. Data analysis is the other thing you would do. Like, for example, looking at your NPS survey, and you know, if your organization does that, and looking at, you know, detractor reasons, L2 and L3, reasons uh, for detraction and what is causing a bad customer experience what is causing good experience uh, the funnel behavior if you actually have a shopping experience funnel you'd want to understand what customers are doing in the funnel how many people are coming in what areas what pages they are looking at where they're dropping off 
So all of this actually gives you insights into the customer behavior. There's no one silver bullet. You have to do a lot of these things to really develop a deeper understanding of the customer. And one of the tools, uh, in, which is very useful in customer discovery, which I've used a lot, you know, uh, at Amazon. So at Am you know, Amazon uses this quite a lot, but there are other companies as well. It's called PR FAQ. So press release and frequently asked questions. It's a six page document, a word document. And you know, the first page is basically a press release. So what you would do is you would write a press release, imagining like when the product you're working on gets released in the market, what would the press release say about that product? And so you're talking about like, you know, the benefits for the customer, who the customer is, right? All of that stuff. So that is your PR. Your frequently asked questions is, as the name suggests, these are questions which your customers might have after reading the press release. It could be your customers, it could be your sellers. For example, you know, is there a trial version? How do I sign up for this service, right? What is the price of the service? So you would actually have those FAQs, um, which will actually like, you know, help you clarify what is the service and what are the various components. And then lastly, you will have some visuals like, you know, wireframes and mocks to kind of make it clear uh, in terms of what, you know, what you want to build. So PR FAQ is a very powerful tool. And the reason it is a very powerful tool is, I think in a very simple way, it actually helps you articulating what you are building, who you are building for. I mean, going back to those, you know, three questions, who, what, why, and why would the customer care about it, right? Because once you start to write a press release and you guys should try it, it's a very powerful tool because once you start to write a press release in very simple terms, talking about why would the customer care about it? What would the customer say about this feature that you're building? What is the benefit for the customer? It drives a lot of clarity, right? Uh, in your mind, even before the first line of code is actually written, right? Um, at the bottom, there's a quote from Ian McAllister, you know, who worked at Amazon and we called it the working backward process. You know, we work backwards from the customer. So we start with the customer and start to think about like, you know, what pain points and requirements they have and hence what solution should be built versus, you know, just starting with an idea and then like, you know, seeing how do we actually force fit that uh, with the customers, right? So, you know, who better to, you know, talk about uh, this working backwards process than, than Jeff Bezos. So I'll just play a little video. Um, and so basically this was an all hands meeting at Amazon where Jeff Bezos was actually asked this question about working backwards process. I mean, this PR FAQ process is called working backwards process. So let's listen in, in terms of the question and like, you know, what he said, I'll play the video and let me know if you, if you can hear it. Uh, is the working back. Hopefully you guys could, could hear the sound. Yes, yeah? Kapil, we can hear the sound. Okay. So I'll just play the video again. Is the working backwards process optional? It sounds great, but it seems like a lot of work. Um, oh boy, how do we begin? Um, well, the working backwards process should not be optional unless you know a better way. And, um, and you shouldn't know a better way until you've tried the working backwards process several times. The working pro backwards process really does work. And, and this particular thing here, it sounds great, but it seems like a lot of work. Done correctly, the working backwards process is a huge amount of work, but it saves you even more work later. The working backwards process is not designed to be easy. It's designed to save huge amounts of work on the back end and to make sure that we're actually building the right thing. What so many companies do is they build the they build the, the, they write the software, that's a lot of work. They get it all working and then they throw it over the wall of the marketing department and say, okay, here's what we built, write the press release for it. That's, that process is the one that's actually backwards. Okay, <clears throat> right, so and again, he's talking about spend all of this time driving clarity in terms of who you're building it for, what you are building and then take it to market versus the other way around that you build something and you're trying to figure out a market for that, right? And again, we'll touch upon some of these things as we go forward. Uh, is the work Okay, so that was the first one, right? What we talked about was an exceptional product manager understands their customers very, very well. And I talked about like, you know, some of the techniques you can use to do that. Let's talk about the second one, you know, uh, I think very good product managers have a you know very good clarity on where they are going. You know, what is the long term 
uh, direction? What is the long term end state for the product, right? And that's where you know your vision and product strategy comes in, right? So let's talk about each of these three components. You know, what is a vision? What is a product strategy? And what is a roadmap? So vision is a statement of where you want to be. I mean, it could be two to three years. After two two years, I want the customer experience to be X, or I want my product to be Y. But it's an end state, and you know, it could be two years. I've also seen vision statements for twelve months as well. It's bold and inspirational, right? So you know, if it is something that we can easily achieve, then I think it's not the right vision statement, uh, and it's concise and all of that stuff, right? So it's basically where you want to be. What do I want to become? Right, not you as a person, but what do I want the product to become? A strategy is the how part, which is like you know how will you realize the vision? How will you actually get there? Right, and strategy is all about choices. So in terms of which direction you take, and the third, of course, is the roadmap, which is like you know your as per your strategy specific list of projects that you want to do, uh, you know, which are spread across multiple projects. Right? So that's the. So I, I'm going to give you an example again, going back to my Swiggy days, right? So we talked about this example of cancellation of the order, right? Very, very bad customer experience. So I treated that as a defect in the system, right? It's actually a defect that the order got cancelled, right? And the vision that I set was, how do we actually have a defect-free, perfect ordering experience for for our customers, right? So basically, there would not be any cancellations. There would not be any delays. It would be this utopia where, you know, you you place an order, you get the food that you ordered, you get it within time, and there is no cancellation, right? But that's the vision. That's where we want to be. And as you can see, it is, you know, crisp. It's bold, right? I mean, we are talking about not reducing defects, but just eliminating the defects, right? Um, but that's the vision that, like, you know, we were actually marching towards. So. Let's talk about the strategy, right? And so, now not focusing on, you know, again, as we saw in the tree, there is the restaurant side cancellation, there is the delivery side cancellation. So, on the restaurant side cancellation, right? What was our strategy? So, we saw that, like, you know, some restaurants actually did better in terms of, you know, having very minimal defects, and some restaurants, you know, were not so good. The strategy was like, you know, how do we incentivize the good actors, the good restaurants, right, who actually have very good metrics in terms of cancellation? And create disincentives for the bad actors, right? So that there is this, you know, incentive disincentive for the restaurant in terms of like, you know, marching towards better and better metrics when it comes to cancellation delays, etc. But at the same time, you also want to empower the restaurants, give them right tools and information. For example, the forecasting ability that I talked about. How do we empower the restaurants to deliver that perfect order experience, right? So that was our strategy, like a combination of these two. And then, like, and of course, the roadmap would follow. And what I like to think is, and I, I think again, this is from Jeff Bezos who said that we have to be stubborn on the vision, right? So we we should not change our vision too frequently or too much. We should be clear about where we want to go. But the strategy, which is the how part, you know, we, we should be flexible, right? Because you choose one direction to get there, but as you are going in that direction, you might learn certain things, and you know, you want you might want to pivot and like you know, choose a different direction. So the vision doesn't change, but the strategy can change as we like you know go along and learn, right? So an exceptional PM actually is, as I mentioned, although they are like you know, executing on projects, they're delivering on projects. There is a quarterly roadmap, but they have this north star in mind in terms of where they want to get to. Okay. Let's talk about the third one, which is R right a lot. So as I mentioned, this is not magic. This is following a systematic process to really, I think, goes back to customer understanding, understanding your customers, and building the right products. And how do you do that? So these are the questions that I'm sure. Again, um, I think how the audience was actually product managers, but I'm sure that you all PMs like you know, must be dealing with, right? So how do I know that the feature that I'm building will be actually used by the customers? How do I choose, you know, which features or which areas of the product to double down, and which one I should deprecate, right? Is it going to be actual business impact that will be delivered through my roadmap, right? And you know, basically, uh, you know, if you look at all of these questions, it's basically about how do I make more right decisions? You know, how do I choose the right areas to invest in, which will deliver business impact, which will improve the customer experience, 
so and you know there is no there is no um, science behind it right if if it was that scientific then like you know you would not need humans to make this decision but as, as a pm you want to be right more number of times than wrong right so how do you do that so i think that's where uh, you know lean product management philosophy comes in and uh, you know basically the idea is that you know once you're actually like you know launching a new product or thinking about a new feature there's a lot of uncertainty right so how do you actually figure out whether it's the right area to kind of like you know invest in and so you would launch uh, uh, a version which is called mvp minimal viable product and you know you would actually iterate through this you know the chart that is on the left build measured learn to figure out the right product uh, through the, through the slide right so what is mvp and now there are different again definitions of mvp but i like this one from eric lee's uh, who's the founder of lean startup movement and he said that you know mvp is that version of a new product which allows you to collect the maximum amount of validated learning about customers with the least effort right so there are three words you know which you should you wish which you should focus on maximum validated and least so you want to get the maximum learning in terms of hey is this the right product you know is there a, is there a market for this product validated you know which is not just in theory but actual customers using the product and like you know giving you feedback and the least effort which is you know with the the least amount of let's say engineering effort you put something out there through which you are getting feedback right so a lot of times you know people focus on the minimal part it doesn't have to be like you know only one feature but the but the the least effort in terms of minimum number of features which gives you that maximum amount of learning right so as i mentioned that focus is maximum learning at minimum investment right that's how you should think about mvp so you know when you start you know you're actually at the leftmost side of this 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 chart where you see that there's a lot of uncertainty you're not sure whether it's the right feature whether somebody is going to use it or not and then you launch the mvp and you go through this build measure learn cycle and then like the uncertainty comes down because you you understand the market better you understand the customers better and then like you know you can make more and more investment you get more confidence right so so the idea is to derive that maximum learning and okay let's just talk about next level for mvp so what is actually an mvp right so let's say that you want to solve a transportation problem you know you want to take people from point a to point b so what would be your mvp is it a car so you start with you know building one wheel and two wheels and body of the car and then you put together the board car or is the approach better where you start with uh, you know a skateboard or a scooter right and then you like you know build a bicycle and a motorcycle and then you build a car right so is the second approach better because in the first approach until you actually build a car and you put it out in the market you would not get any feedback you know because you know you're just waiting for the entire car to be built whereas in this one at least if you launch let's say i don't know like a, a skateboard right it can help help somebody go from point a to point b so in in a sense it solves that problem maybe not completely right but it solves the problem at least you now you'll start to see okay do people want to go from point a to point b is it a real problem how many customers are actually using it right so so that's the mvp approach right where you like i said launch a minimal version of the product which gives you that learning that maximum learning for you to further iterate and by the way an mvp doesn't have to be an actual product right um it could be also a video so here is an example from dropbox which i'm sure you all know it's a cloud you know based uh, file sharing service um uh, and you know they actually had this like you know beta version uh, but they were not getting enough traction so what their founder drew houston did was he basically created this 3 minute video where he just like you know just did a demo of the product and like you know talked about the value proposition and how easily it was for you to store your files in the cloud and they would magically sync across devices etc etc right and just you know and he posted that video on on, on the website and their beta sign up list went from 5000 to 75000 overnight right so here is an example of um you know actually a video which can be your mvp which helps you understand okay how many customers actually interested in this because if in a very simple way you're able to articulate what is the value proposition so an mvp can also be like a simple landing page like you know where you talk about the product and the service and there's a form that the customer can fill if they're interested in signing up for that service right because it gives you learning in terms of like you know how many customers are actually interested in that right 
so in the interest of time i'm just going to skip this uh, this question a little bit uh, and then move to the next thing so so some myths and things to avoid on mvp it has to be a product or feature as i mentioned that that's a myth it doesn't have to be avoid um, focusing too much on the minimum aspect of the mvp so as i mentioned it's the right minimum which gives you the maximum learning so it doesn't mean that it has only one feature or like you know one flow avoid focus on driving revenues goals too early right because what you want to do is you're trying to figure out the product market fit so focusing on monetization too early is not the right thing to do in the product life cycle and mvp failed means end of the road which is also not true because you know that's where like you know you would pivot and think of a totally new solution to solve that customer problem and the last mistake is like you know sometimes you know uh, you know product managers think that like you know they have figured out the right solution and they do not iterate enough which is also not right so to put put it all together uh, you go through this build measure learn until you actually achieve a product market fit where you have the right product and you would know because you know customers would be raving about this product and there'll be like a you know, good bird of mouth and you know adoption would actually like you know really increase so you would know when you have reached a product market fit and then you know once you do that then it's about scaling right and 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 so i think you know if, if there's one thing i want to want to take away from this is you should focus on like you know launching and learning and iterating right because the the learnings that you get by launching the product is far more then what you would actually get by just thinking about it like you know with your with your colleagues for example and so you know i'll just give you one example a case study from my adobe days right um so in adobe we were actually um you know working on this new app so there's a new product that we're building it was targeted at enterprises right so any company which was doing procedures um it could be maintenance procedure it could be you know operating procedure could be like an industrial company or energy company but basically any company which was doing procedures in a paper based format right it was very non intelligent way of doing procedures so what we were building was this app where the where the employees could do the procedures in a smart way using their mobile devices you know a tablet or a phone and it would be a smart intelligent procedure where it would like you know capture all the things and it would be electronically stored and all of that stuff right so we're launching this new product and of course like you know there were a lot of discussions and debates amongst ourselves in terms of what features to build who to target etc and you know when we launched the beta and we actually had a few beta customer testing the product you know the feedback that we got was so much more useful right and we actually got feedback in those areas that like you know we had not even imagined so for example like you know we got feedback from customers in terms of hey the product is great i'm really interested but i have all of these procedures you know which are actually written up in word right how do i convert these procedures into the smart xml format which this app would consume right and that's an area that you know we had not i mean frankly thought about at all right so then you know we start to think about do we provide a utility to the customers along with the product through which you know they can convert the procedures right but the point i'm making is you get a lot of very very useful feedback once you have real customers testing your product in their in, in their day to day life you know in their work setting there is no substitute for that feedback so you should actually focus on launching figuring out that mvp and driving the learning that way okay so going forward um say no a lot right so we all know about the importance of prioritization right um because as a pm like you know you basically have always more features that you know you can actually build given the engineering bandwidth uh you know you have you know of course requests from customers you know your sales team your other business teams engineers might also have some ideas and of course you have your own ideas as well so how do you prioritize and i think it exceptional pm does a very good job in prioritizing and like i said saying no to more things than they say yes to right it's it's very very important for for us to understand that as pms we have to say no to more shiny objects than we say yes to because that would ensure that like you know we are focused and again i'll just give you a short example from you know my amazon days so when we are like you know when we launched this b2b marketplace on amazon and our customers were again like you know businesses right um so there was this temptation that you know should we also go after the enterprise customer right because enterprise you know by definition are large you know they have lot of spend in terms of the business supplies that they that they purchase so it was a huge market 
but like you know we decided to say no to that opportunity when we launched the service and the reason for that was you know smb itself was a huge market their requirements were simpler whereas on the other hand enterprise requirements were like you know more complex they needed things like an you know, integration with the procurement systems and you know different invoicing as well as a different like you know consolidated shipping as well right so but i think it was the right decision to say that hey we're not going to focus on the enterprises so that was our no we'll focus on the smb opportunity because the requirements are more similar we want to start with that and keep the team focused right so so let me just again like you know uh, ask you guys um, how do you prioritize like you know what are the some of the things that you look at when you're looking at this long list of features and projects uh, how do you prioritize among among these features again please type in your responses in the chat window. Our audience is busy posting questions for you, Kapil. If you can see, we have so many questions lined up for you already. But okay. yeah, we have the answer for that question as well. Okay, price framework, revenue forecast. So I think I think you're talking about the impact, business criticality. Okay, make MVP ready first. Yeah, so you want to you know have those features built first. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you guys are touching upon, and you know, the, the prioritization could be different if you're launching a new product, and of course you have to think about the MVP. But if it's, if it's an existing product, then like you know, looking at impact, looking at feasibility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So and and you know, there are various frameworks for prioritization, um, and I'll just share like a few of them. So here is one. So it has impact and effort, as many of you mentioned. So in this two by two, like, you know, if it's like, you know, low effort and high on impact, that's an easy, that's something that of course, you know, you should do. And on the extreme, you know, on the diagonally opposite, it's like high effort and low impact, you want to avoid those features. Then you have the low, low, which is like, you know, your incremental improvements, like, you know, things that like, you know, you can keep on doing. What's interesting is the big bet, right? So you have high impact and high effort. So what do you do here, right? How do you make a decision whether you should pick it up or not? Again, type in the chat window. How do you decide among those features? Yeah, so let's say you actually have, you know, let's say five of these long term bets, which are or potentially high impact, right? Do you not pick any of them? You pick some of them. If you pick, you know, which ones do you pick? How do you decide, right? Because the remaining ones are sort of like, you know, easier. Roadmap fit. So again, there is no one right answer, right? I mean, you can look at it different ways. You can say that, okay, I can take the MVP approach. Here is a big bet. I do not know whether it's gonna work or not. Let me launch an MVP version first, right? And then see, like, you know, whether it actually works or not. If it's getting traction, then I'll actually invest more. You can also see whether it is aligned to the long term vision. You can see whether it is, like, you know, from a competition perspective, like, you know, whether it's a feature that you should actually have because the competition also has it. And hence, it's a big bet that, you know, you must take. So there are a lot of, like, you know, different ways in an ambition, you know, you can look at. And, but those are the interesting, challenging, and rewarding things. That you would do as a PM in terms of like you know making these decisions, okay? And you know you guys touched upon some of these other frameworks. So there's the Rise framework, which is reach, impact, confidence, and effort. So I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Like you know you would look at the number of customers it's going to impact, which is your reach, the impact, and business impact would be conversion, could be revenue, the confidence, which is an interesting one, right? Which is what is your confidence in terms of delivering that impact? or in terms of reach and the effort, it introduces that level of, or, or that dimension of confidence rather uh, into the mix. And so you do reach impact confidence divided by effort is your rise score. And you'd want to prioritize the features which actually have a higher rise score. The other one, um, I think is the is the Kano model. Uh, it was, uh, you know, proposed by a, a Japanese guy. And it basically looks at, you know, uh, the customer, 
satisfaction or dissatisfaction on the on the y axis and on the x axis you know it basically is whether the feature is not implemented to fully implemented those those are the ends of the spectrum and then you know through customer survey you divide your features into three parts you know the bottom line is the basics which is your must have features right without that you know customers would not use the product so for example if you're running an e-commerce um, i don't know like you know and, uh, giving customers an option to like you know pay using different pay modes is a very basic capability if you do not have that customers would not use that then the middle is performance which is sort of your incremental improvements the more you do it the better it is and the last one which is the interesting one is delighters right so these are the features which customers are not expecting right but if you provide them like they will be actually hugely satisfied but the absence of those doesn't mean that the customer will be very dissatisfied right and so you definitely want to cover the must haves or the basics and then you want to have a mix of let's say performance features as well as some delighters in your roadmap so that's another way to look at the the roadmap and you know i think one thing again i want to take away from this is the roadmap development and prioritization is as much of an art as it is science. So there's a lot of like, you know, judgment and various factors involved. If it was as simple as a formula, you know, you would just basically put the parameters into, into like a, you know, machine and it would like, you know, spit out the roadmap for you, right? But that's not the case. Um, you know, you have to look at, okay, how do I balance between the short-term priorities versus the long-term big bets? How do I make sure that I'm also building uh, for the future, you know, how do I actually have some you know, totally new ideas and experiments and delighters in my roadmap? Is my roadmap in, in line with the long term vision and the all goals or not? And you also want to allocate some bandwidth for your tech projects as well, right? So it's 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 a balancing act that you know you will need to do. And you know, again, uh, an exceptional product manager does a very good job at balancing their roadmap on these various dimensions. Okay, so um, I have a few more slides to cover. So I'll try to kind of go through those a little quickly. Um, so since we are actually like, you know, just uh, running behind time. So the next one is uh, think 10x and not just 10%, right? So exceptional PMs, you know, think of ideas with 10x the impact and not just the 10% improvement, right? It's an order of magnitude improvement that they think of, right? And why 10%, you know, why not 10%? Because 10% means that, you know, you're doing the same thing as everybody else, like Larry Gates said, right? Uh, because when you're doing 10%, you're not differentiated. You do not have a competitive mode, right? Um, and any competition which does 10x improvement can basically obliterate you, right? So, so we have to also think of new ways of solving the customer problem, which give you 10x the impact. And I'll share some examples, right? So this is, um, you know, the classical S curve, right? Which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, you know, when you actually have a new technology, there is some adoption, there are early adopters, and then it increases and the technology improves and there's exponential growth and then it flattens out, right? Until a new technology comes and displaces that. And there are a lot of examples of companies which did not do the 10x thinking, and there are examples of companies you know which did the 10x thinking. So, so let me just pick you know one each. So Nokia and smartphone, right? So Nokia, you know, in its time, I think in 2005, it was actually the fifth most valuable brand. Um, they had more than 50 billion in revenues in 2007, and their market share was like you know 40 percent. But Nokia was a leader in feature phones, and that's what they were thinking. I mean, they were making improvements to the feature phones in terms of packing more features and more hardware into thinner, lighter phones, right? But they were a 10% company. They were making improvements, right? And then along came Apple in 2007, launched the smartphone, and, you know, rest, as we all know, is history, right? Because, you know, Nokia lost uh, half of its market share in five to six years. So it was a 10% company. It was not doing 10x thinking. On the other hand, if you talk about Netflix, right? So Netflix is a company which actually started, you know, with a disruptive model. You know, it basically started with a DVD rental, where as a customer, I could actually order the DVDs. And I had a list of uh, movies in my queue. And as soon as I returned the DVD, the next the next DVD would actually come in my mailbox, right? And so, you know, compar comparison was blockbuster, where people actually had to go to the store and like, you know, borrow a DVD. It was pretty disruptive in that sense, right? But then, like, you know, as technology improved and internet speeds improved and streaming actually became a reality, Netflix disrupted itself. So they actually, like, launched the streaming service, which actually disrupted their DVD rental business, right? But 
they were thinking 10x, right? They were thinking of like, you know, how do I leverage technology in new interesting ways to solve the customer problem versus being tied to the business that they actually already had. Then they also did one more disruption in terms of creating own original content, right? I think House of Cards was the first show uh, because they did not want to rely on just third party content providers, right? So Netflix, I mean, both of these moves are 10x moves, right? Because, you know, if you think about it, in each case, they were sort of disrupting their own business in a way, right? So that's an example of 10x strategy, and that's why Netflix is so successful. I would not go through the remaining examples in the interest of time. Um, just one quick example of, uh, you know, from my Adobe days, right? So again, you know, we were working uh, on this product, I mean, not working, but, you know, this was the product that I was managing called Adobe FrameMaker, you know, targeted at the technical writers, you know, who would create various technical content and publish it to multiple devices. So, that's a, that's a cliche. It, it was not a nice market, but it was a nice market. It was a niche market. It was a very small market. It was mature as well. And it like it was growing like, you know, at a small rate, right? We were thinking that like, you know, how do we actually step back and think about like, you know, new solutions, new products? And how do we go from here to like, you know, 10x the market? So one of the challenges that the technical writers actually had was you know, this collaboration with various subject matter experts. So they would create the document, they would create a PDF out of it, they would send it to a collaborator. So it could be an engineer, it could be a marketer, who would then like go through the PDF, add the comments in the PDF, would come back to the technical writer, and the poor technical writer basically had to go through all the comments and then manually like, you know, uh, make the changes in the document, right? So the collaboration was actually pretty broken. And what was also interesting was if you look at the ratio, there were 10 collaborators for each technical writer, right? So the ratio was one to 10. So we said that how do we actually address the pain point as well as tap into a market which was 10 times larger? And so we said, how about we actually launch a lighter version of the product, a lighter version of FrameMaker through which like, you know, um, the, the SME or the collaborator also has, also has a lighter version. It's a simplified version. It's a cheaper version because frankly, they are not going to be using FrameMaker day in, day out and give that tool to the collaborators. And then it will you know, solve that uh, collaboration pain point as well as help us like, you know, tap into a market which is 10 times larger. So this is one example, like, you know, which I want to share from my experience in terms of how the team did 10x thinking. And the question is, you know, why don't enough of us, why don't enough companies do it? You know, is it necessarily hard? Is the implementation hard? Not necessarily, right? If you think about it, it's not, it's not hard. And like, you know, here is one quote that you can read where this guy who actually works at Google X is arguing that's actually better. It's easier to, to, to make a service or a product 10 times better than it is to, you know, make marginal improvements, but it does require a change in mindset. It does require a change in perspective right? Uh, to think about the problems differently, right? It requires first principle thinking where you actually break up a problem into like, you know, small components where each component is basically the fundamental truth. And, you know, using those components, you know, can almost build up the, a new solution uh, from scratch. Uh, it requires you to challenge everything, right? Challenge all the assumptions. And why should we do it this way? Just because, you know, we have been doing it this way doesn't mean it's the right way. You know, ask the question, right questions. And like I said, a willingness to disrupt yourself, which is like a new solution which can disrupt your existing business. But if you don't do that, maybe somebody else will do that, right? So might as well disrupt yourself versus versus another company. So it does require a different sort of perspective as well. Okay, last part. So as the product manager, as I mentioned, you know, you are at the center of it all, right? So if you, if you look at the typical product development cycle, right? It starts with customer discovery as we talked about. And, you know, on the, on the, in the boxes on the right, you know, you see the teams that like the PM uh, would be working with. So customer discovery, you probably will be working with the user research team. Then, you know, you have to prioritize, you know, a lot of ideas among the ideas and the features that you have, and probably you'll work with your business counterparts and understanding the business impact and prioritizing it that way. Then you would actually build the product. And there, you know, you'll work with design, engineering, data sciences team, right? Quality, QA engineering, you do the UAT, launch and go to market. And that's where you might work with them, with the marketing team and the business teams in terms of like, you know, going to market and driving adoption of the product. Then we'd want to measure the impact of like, you know, what we have 
launched and that's where you might work with analytics team right and then the cycle would repeat so the point of all of this is like you know as a pm you're at the center of it all and there are lots and lots of different teams that you're working with right but you are the subject matter expert on the product and the customer and what they need and hence like you know you have to sort of manage this orchestra and you know you're that's the analogy that you're the conductor of this orchestra you are basically taking all of these teams along with you and i think you know exceptional pms are actually you know they are great leaders right it's not just about technical ability or analytical ability or or anything like that they are great leaders in the sense that they like i said they set a clear vision and they're able to rally the troops behind that vision they're able to you know influence without authority i mean this is very very important in a pm job right because as pms you know do not have formal authority or reporting relationship with the business teams with the engineering teams so you want to be able to influence you know with data with the customer understanding with the mvp and the experiments that you do and those learnings right you want to be as objective as possible and great pms do that very very well they set a vision and they're able to influence all of these teams and really motivate them uh, in terms of marching towards that vision they're great communicators right um, and i do not mean like you know using very flowery words but in very simple easy to understand terms they able to articulate where they want to go why do they want to go there how are they thinking of prioritization and then the impact of releases like you know what is it that we have learned uh, after the release actually has been has been made and then lastly high on eq i mean uh, you know you're working with variety of teams and you need to kind of tailor your communication tailor your style you know there's a different way you would talk to an engineer versus a design person for example right um and data science and sales and you know of course executive uh leadership as well the high on eq in terms of how to kind of like you know tailor their style working style to work with these different teams right um i think just a few other points uh, i think probably this is the last slide that i have um and then we can go to q and a holistic understanding of the entire ecosystem so they don't understand just their areas but like for example in a marketplace you understand the customer side but you also understand the delivery side you also understand the the, the restaurant side right actually have the holistic understanding is very very useful in developing the right products dealing with ambiguity the third point is important focus on outcomes rather than just output what i mean by that is it's not just about how many features you know you have launched but exceptional pms you know focus more on what has been the outcome of those features you know what is the impact of those features how is the customer experience improving how is the number of bookings improving they are very focused on that and they keep on like you know tweaking their strategy and roadmap basis right they are curious and they are very like you know well read and like you know they actually uh, identify best practices and innovations from other industries and apply it in there right so those are some of the other points like you know which i have seen uh, good teams do So I think that's it uh, from my side. Um, I think it actually we, we were over by ten minutes. So apologies for that. But uh, yeah, we can take any questions. Thank you, Kapil, for delivering a brilliant session. Really great insights. And of course, please don't apologize. This has been a great session and very insightful. And our audience is is ready to ask you questions. So we'll take a few from the Q and A window right now. So uh, there is a question from Arushi Arora. Arshu, do you want to come online and ask the question, or I'll reach it out. You can raise your hand, and I could unmute you. And Shama, how do I see the questions? I am not able to open up the Q and A. Oh, you should be able to. Uh, couple. Okay, let me see. Okay, now I'm able to see. Yeah. Okay. Right. Give me a second. So, yes, Arshu, please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. Thank you, Shama. So, hi, Kapil. Thank you so much for the session. It was very insightful. Uh, my question to you is: uh, you you mentioned about how it how important it is for a product manager to understand the customer behavior and uh, customer know how the customer is thinking, right? Uh, now, considering that uh, 
knowing the customer deeply is uh, one important aspect of product management. So the, 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 the people from customer support background who have been working with the customers on a regular basis, they, they obviously understand the customer behavior, their pain points, et cetera, very well. Now, usually they also work very closely with the engineering teams, the product teams, and all the internal stakeholder teams, right? So in your opinion, how easy or how difficult is it for people with this kind of experience along with some technical background as well. Uh, how easy or difficult can it be for people like these to move to a product management role? Yeah, great question. And, you know, so I think there is no one profile for a product management. Right. I mean, there's more common profile, which is like, you know, somebody with an engineering degree, worked as a software engineer, did an MBA and moved into product management. But then there are exceptions as well. Like, you know, you'll, be, you'll see people who actually have an art background doing product management, right? So I think what it requires, as I mentioned, is an understanding of the customer, right? You need to have like, you know, enough technical understanding so you can be effective with, with engineers and like, you know, work with them and understand what is feasible, what is not feasible. Absolutely. But of course, that doesn't mean that like, you know, you have to code because there is actually engineers for that, right? So you need to have enough understanding of all the different areas, whether it is technology, whether it is user experience, whether it is business. Right. But there are actually specialists that you're working with in each of those areas. So you do not have to be a deep, deep expert. As I mentioned, you know, you have to have a very good understanding of your customers. You need to have a very good understanding of, you know, which problems and which ones you want to prioritize. And how would you use technology in building solutions to solve those pain points? Right. So those are the three things and I'll, I'll go back to. Doesn't mean that like you, know, you have to be an engineer by background or if you do not have a technical background that you would not be successful as a product manager. Okay. So it is uh, not very difficult to get into product management with this background, correct? No, I, I would not say, it, I would not comment on how easy or difficult it okay. is, but it's definitely possible. A lot of examples. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I, I think for I get the gist. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for coming forward. So uh, Kapil, uh, we'll take this next question from Anirudh. It's in the Q&A window. How does yeah. one get a set of customers for the MVP given that product focuses a very niche market where there could be a lot of security concerns? Second part, what do we mean by data? What would be the ideal matrix that one can use to learn and iterate? Sorry, can you repeat the first part again? Uh, how, sure. do we... hmm. how does one get a set of customers for the MVP given that product focuses a very niche market where there could be a lot of security concerns. Mm, okay. So if you're operating in a very niche market, how do you actually get customers to try out your MVP? Is that right? Right. So actually, you know, I was in that situation, you know, in, in, in Adobe, uh, there was another new product that we were actually working on and it was sort of in stealth mode. So we could not just go out in public. Um, and it was actually like, you know, targeted at like, you know, uh, businesses, right? So I think there is no one clear answer, but I think what worked was, you know, I would actually like, you know, uh, go out and attend conferences where these customers would be. And through one-on-one, -on -one, I'll just talk about how we were thinking about the solution and what we were thinking of and whether they'd be interested. So that's how I actually got some customers to sign up uh, for the beta program and you know, try out our product. Um, and then it was like, you know, through like, you know, people who were already using our main products to their context, you know, so that's how we actually got these customers to come to the beta program and give us feedback. But there was no one easy way uh, in that sense because we could not go public. It was a very niche market. So it, it was not like there was actually lots and lots of customers like, you know, who wanted to use the product. Um, what was the second question? What do we mean by data? What would be the ideal matrix uh, that one could use to learn and iterate? Oh, so, I mean, that really depends in terms of, uh, you know, the product um, where you're trying to kind of measure the impact. I mean, the metrics could be, uh, for example, you know, a number of bookings or number of transactions, right? Is it increasing that? The metric could be conversion, which is how many people are coming into the funnel and how many people are actually taking them and then making a transaction. Uh, the metric could be profitability in terms of like, you know, on each booking, are we making more profit or not? The metric would be customer experience, which is ultimately, is it leading to higher NPS or not? Right? So I think the metric really depends on, and by the way, there could be like a few different metrics. It doesn't have to be only one, but there could be a few different metrics that you want to improve through the feature that, that, that you're launching. So it really depends. 
Great. I hope that answers your questions, Anirudh. So, uh, moving on to the next question, uh, we'll take the next one from Paul. Given that PMs are the middle of functions, vision, strategy, roadmap, and are involved in the entire loop of the iteration cycle, what would be the most effective way to measure the success and performance of excellent PMs or key performance indicators? Mm. It's, it's a good question. And, you know, um, of course, there is, you know, the ultimate uh, outcome, which is, you know, what is the impact that the PM has been able to deliver? So impact could be measured in, in you know, in, in, in the metrics that I talked about, right? Which is, you know, how much incremental revenue or how much more profit, right? But there's also the inputs which go into that. So that's the outcome. But what are the, you know, inputs which the PM is driving, which is leading towards that? So for example, you know, in terms of like, you know, learning and figuring out what is the right product, what is the process the PM actually has used for that? In terms of, um, you know, Again, long-term strategy, is there a clear roadmap, not just for this quarter, but also for the long-term? In terms of like, you know, how well the PM actually understands the domain and the customers, and hence will be more likely to build the right solutions, right? So those are all inputs, collaboration with stakeholders in terms of how will they work with business engineering. So those are all the inputs which go into that output, which is like I said, ultimate business impact. I like to look at both of these, right? Because sometimes, the output or the outcome in terms of business impact, you know, may not tell you the complete story because the PM might have done like you know, a lot of right things, but still that output is not there. It could be that, you know, the market was not ready. It could be that it will take some time. So just measuring a PM on the final output is not, it's not fair. I think it's also like you know, a bunch of those inputs which go into that uh, are the other things that I personally like to look at when assessing a product management. Thank you, Paul, for your question. Uh, so the next question, couple, we will take from Ananya Dixit. What to do if we want to build a product for internal consumption? Example, mm. building a recommendation system for sales team to understand and boost sales by bundling the products. What would be the MVP like in that case? What metrics can be tracked for this? Yeah, so I think, you know, Ananya, that's a, that's a very good question. And um, I've had some experience in terms of building products for internal folks as well. Um, for example, at Swiggy. I think the approach at a high level has is exactly the same. It just happens that you know your customer is actually an internal team versus a like an outside customer or a B2C consumer, right? But how you think about, you know, okay, how do they actually currently do, you know, um, uh, you know, sales forecasting, for example, right? What is the process that they follow? Understanding that very well. And then thinking about like, you know, what are the pain points and, you know, what solutions I can build, which can actually really help them and be more productive and like do a much better job, right? So the thought process is exactly the same. It just so happens that your customer is actually an internal one, right? But that being said, I think like, you know, having an internal customer makes it a bit easy as well. Because I think going back to what we were discussing earlier, you don't have to kind of go out in the market and get people to kind of try out the product. There's actually a team which is sitting right there, which can actually help you like, you know, test the product and give you feedback. Um, so it actually like, you know, that iteration can be much, much faster versus like an external product. But I would say the thought process has to be exactly the same. Your metrics might be different because, you know, here you're not talking about, let's say the revenue or the profitability. Here you're talking about you know, effectiveness of the sales team, their productivity, you know, ultimately because of this recommendation engine, are they able to do more sales, for example? So the metrics might change, but I think the approach and the way you go about it would be fairly similar, um, you know, um, as compared to if you're building a product for external customers as well. Great. Uh, so a couple, I hope you have time to take at least a few more questions, maybe two more questions. Can yeah, we take, can take a couple of more. Yeah, sure. Sure. So we'll take this one question from a LinkedIn viewer so mm. that they don't feel that, you know, we're not paying enough attention to them. Thank mm. you guys, by the way, for watching us via LinkedIn. So this question is from Adinath Jadav. MVP works for new products. What approach to take for advancement of current product? Is it still MVP? Yeah, again, again, a good question, right? So if you talk about existing product, let's just take a make my trip example, right? I mean, you actually have this make my trip app, and like in a way somebody can go and book a hotel. I mean, that's an existing product. So is there an MVP there or not? So the short answer is yes. 
um, think about MVP as not just a, a new product, but it could be like, you know, there's a new feature that you want to launch, right? And for that new feature, and let's say again, there's a lot of uncertainty whether customers would actually use it or not. You can actually have an MVP version of that new feature, right? Um, so for example, I'll just give an example. Let, let's say you want to have videos, you know, of the hotels along with the pictures. And let's say that there were no videos, right? So you want to have the ability to show videos as well, but you're not sure whether it will be useful to the customers, how many customers would use the, uh, watch the videos, whether it will lead to higher conversion or not. So the MVP could be, right? You would actually like, you know, source these videos for hundred hotels and you would actually build a simple placeholder in your shopping experience where the customer can see the video and play the video, but you would do it for a limited set. And rather than like, you know, getting it for thousands and thousands of hotels and like, you know, building a very fancy experience, but just that would give you learning in terms of how many customers are watching the video, right? Are they moving ahead in the funnel? What is the impact on the conversion? Are they like, you know, watching the entire video? You can, of course, like, you know, go and like, you know, call up some customers to understand whether the video was helpful or not. So that could be an example of an MVP, probably not a very good example I'm giving, but I think you get the idea. Even if you're building a new feature in an existing product, which requires significant investment, you can take this MVP approach, uh, you know, in, in your development. Yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Yes, absolutely. So we'll take this uh, next question from Rohit Nakpal. Uh, Question on getting to know the customer users very well. We are creating a B2B product. We have access to certain number of potential users and we have spoken with them. However, what users think and do may be different. So how can we uh, know them even better? One way is to follow the activities for a certain amount of time. However, that does not uh, been, that, that's, that has not been possible for a year due to the pandemic and it also requires a lot of time. Mm. Any suggestions or am I missing something? No, you know, I will actually flip it, uh, Rohit. I would say ki if it requires a lot of time, but it's actually useful, probably it's worth spending that time. Um, I think you might remember that, like, you know, uh, you know, that video that I played of Jeff Bezos, which is the more time you spend with the customer, the more time you spend in understanding the customer, you know, the better it is because it will actually, you know, avoid rework later on, right? So I understand in these times, you know, you cannot go and physically meet your customers and your customers are actually like businesses, but you know, in, in normal times, you know, when in Adobe, what I used to do was I would actually go uh, to the offices of the customers. I would actually sit down and I would actually see how they use FrameMaker. And you know, that was an eye opener uh, for me because what I realized was, you know, they are probably like, you know, 10% of the features that we have in the product which actually like, you know, cover 90% of the use cases, right? So the focus suddenly became, you know, rather than like, you know, trying to focus on all the features, how do we actually like, you know, make sure that the experience for these 10 features, these 10 workflows is world class, right? So I think, you know, in, in the current environment, you know, you can think of like, you know, doing Zoom calls where they can share the screen and, you know, they can, they can show you how they're actually using the product and you just watch and observe them. I mean, that's what you would do in usability testing where the customer would actually come in and like, you know, you'll give them a task and they'll use the product to kind of they can complete that task. So it's very, very important. And I think even if it is requires a lot of time investment, it's just, it's worth spending time on. But as I mentioned, uh, there are various other techniques as well. I mean, this is one way, you know, having, you know, one-on-one -on -one customer conversations, um, listening to customer calls, support calls, if you have an existing product in the market, these are other ways in, you know, in which, you know, you can develop a deeper understanding of the customer. Great explanation, Kapil, I must say. Uh, so we'll take this one last question and uh, we are good to wind up the session. Uh, so uh, this question is from Arun and it's, it's a good one to end with. What is a good book or any source of information you would suggest to understand the tech side of development for a product manager with a non-tech background to get an idea of timeliness, uh, sorry, timelines and executable, non-executable features. To understand the tech side of things. Um, you know, it's a good question. I do not know if I have a good answer to it because I mean, frankly, I haven't read any one book to help me understand the tech side of things. I mean, I'm an engineer by background and like, you know, uh, so, you know, I had some understanding. 
I think what I do is uh, rather than one book, I do like you know just read up in terms of blogs and articles um, on product management as well as on technology. So I think like, there are a lot of things that you know you can find. Uh, but if there's one book on product management which I would recommend um, would be Lean Startup from Eric Ries, right? And you know that book actually explains a lot of these concepts in much more detail, you know, which I actually referred to in the presentation. In terms of like you know, how do you think about product management? How do you think about MVP? How do you think about uh, learning? How do you actually iterate? It's a very rich book. And by the way, I'm actually reading that book again um, because the book is so good. Uh, I had already read it. I'm reading it again. That's one book I would recommend that you know all of you guys should actually read it. Um, there are a few other books. You know, there is uh, Hooked by Nirayal, which I think was a good one, right? Um, so I think these are the you know two books I would recommend um, on product management in general. Um, but I would say that just like you know Google, and I'm sure you can find tons and tons of resources, um, videos, tutorials, blogs that you can follow if you're more interested in developing a better understanding on the tech side of things. Okay. So we do have a few more questions, but audience, in view of the time constraints, we have to end the Q&A here. Thanks for the participation, though. Uh, so if you have any further questions, you can connect with Kapil over LinkedIn or other mediums. I hope that's okay with you, Kapil. Yeah, sure. Right. And a quick reminder, please uh, go ahead and scan the QR code on your screen for a 30-minute exclusive session with our industry practitioners like Kapil to clear all your doubts on transition to a product management role or any queries that you may have. So and now for the final and the most exciting part of the session, I request Kapil to please help us pick the champion of curiosity for asking the best question tonight. It's going to be a tough one, Kapil, because we have so many good questions and curious minds here tonight. Yeah. Yeah. There were actually a lot of good questions. And, you know, I think uh, throughout the session, you guys were very... Uh, uh, participative, like, you know, you were actually sharing your thoughts on chat. So absolutely. The interaction was amazing. We love the enthusiasm. Audience. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's hard to pick one, but I guess I, if I have to pick one, I would pick that question on, you know, MVP for an existing feature. I mean, is there a concept of MVP if you have an existing product? Uh, that would be the question that I would pick. Okay. Okay. I just have to scroll through for the name. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I also don't remember the name, but I think it was the maybe the second last or the third last question that you had asked me. You can see the questions in the answered section, Kapil. So the ones that we have taken today. Uh, okay, in the Q&A window, yeah. So that should help you. Meanwhile, audience, uh, please share your feedback and let us know your experience and learnings from the webinars hosted by the Institute. So uh, yes, of course, it will help us uh, plan and deliver the... Uh, webinars in a much better way in the future. So please go ahead and share your experience with us. The link is in the chat window. So yes, Kapil, do we have a winner? Yeah, I also cannot find that question. I don't know if it came from LinkedIn. Okay, got it. Uh, I, I, I hope you understand the question, right? Yes. Okay. So, right. So congratulations on winning the free digital course and we'll get in touch with you shortly. We have enjoyed having you with us, Kapil, and it's been a complete pleasure. Please accept this certificate of appreciation from the Institute. So if you scan the QR code on your right, uh, it will take you to a dedicated Hall of Fame page that we have created for you and uh, with the recording of the session. Please share it with your network and we will do the same. We will update the video on our YouTube for all the viewers. We are grateful for the time and effort you took to share your thoughts and amazing insights drawn from years of research and experience in the industry, Kapil. And I'm certain that our audience will definitely benefit from the methods you suggested and get ahead in their career. Thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Shama, for actually having me. And, um, you know, hopefully this was actually useful. And wish you guys all the very best in your product management career. Thank you, Kapil. And audience, thank you for joining in. It was great interacting with you all. Do not forget to register for our upcoming webinars and please fill out the feedback forms. With that, with that note, I end tonight's session. Happy learning and stay skilled. Have a great night. Thank you, Kapil. You have a great night too. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.